Hey friends, welcome back to Daily Devo. My name is Whitney Mead and I'm so glad that you joined me today for this lesson. I am going to be diving into the book of Nehemiah with you. The Lord put this on my heart about a month ago to start studying Nehemiah and start applying the book of Nehemiah to the time that we are in right now. I want to congratulate you because you are literally living through one of the most incredible time periods of history of all time of all time. And the Lord has given you a very specific calling. There's a very specific reason that you are alive right now. And I think through the study of Nehemiah that you are going to discover what your next steps are. You're going to discover um, what he has planned for you, or at least he's going to give you a little glimpse of a vision of what your next steps are supposed to be during this really crazy and hectic and overwhelming tyrannical season of life that we've been living through. But hey, like we're still together. I've still managed to stay on YouTube for uh, some blessed reason. They have not taken me down yet. So I'm glad we're together and we get to study this. I want to start out today's lesson by reading the first chapter of Nehemiah to you. Um, Nehemiah was probably written by Nehemiah, but could have been written by Ezra as well. A lot of times Ezra and Nehemiah go together. In fact, in the Jewish um, the Jewish text, those two are connected together into one book. Um, but let's get into the book. And, and um, if you've never studied Nehemiah, you're in for a real treat. So let's go. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. Now you have to realize Jerusalem is God's city. His heart is Jerusalem. And so for this ta- this town to be completely demolished and the Jewish people to be left completely unarmed, this was a huge problem. It grieved the heart of God, and as you'll see, he had a he had a great plan. As soon as I heard the, these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. I want to stop here and note that as Nehemiah prayed in intercession to the Lord for the Israelites, he was claiming the sin of the people. He was not um, confessing his own sin and the Israelites were not confessing their sin. Nehemiah was confessing on behalf of all of them. Now, if you have been a patriot in this season and you have felt the burden to go before the throne of God and intercede for the people of the world, whatever nation you are living in, you put yourself in Nehemiah's position right now. You have been doing that yourself. You have been approaching the throne of God and saying, Lord, this country does not recognize you anymore. We have sinned against you. Even if you personally have a righteous relationship with him, The entire Bible continually points to the work of Jesus and Jesus took on our sin on the cross. And in this story, Nehemiah is functioning like a Christ. He's not acting, he isn't Jesus, but he's, he's representing an element of what we could look forward to and seeing in the savior in the future. So Nehemiah has approached the the throne of the Lord to intercede. Let's keep on reading. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. How familiar does that sound right now? That is 
exactly what we are experiencing right now. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to a place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. So Nehemiah goes before the throne of God and he petitions on behalf of all of the Israelites and says, we collectively have sinned against you, which I think that we can kind of relate to that. There's so much in this world that we have refused to take a stand for in the name of being politically correct. We have been afraid as a church to take strong stances on the things that we know to be fully and wholly against the word of God in the name of love. So that's what happens. We say, okay, well, sure, let's take homosexuality as an example. We know that that is staunchly against the word of God, staunchly against the word of God. But because of maybe woke culture, which we didn't have a term for that 10 years ago, but because of woke culture and being politically correct and wanting to show love to everybody, we refuse to delineate that sin and say that is a wrong sin just as any other sin is, gluttony, adultery, um, thievery, all of these things that we know grieve the heart of God. We've refused to take a stance on the harder things, the things that the culture actually cares about. And so Nehemiah has, has gone to the Lord and said, hey, we have sinned against you. We have, we have tarnished your name. We know you're grieved with us. We know you're sad. Please, please look on us, save us. And grant me favor today as I get ready to do something really big. And then he says, I was cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah had an incredible royal position. He was the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. Now, King Artaxerxes, just to kind of put this in perspective for you, is the son of King Xerxes and Queen Vashti. Do you remember from Esther? Okay, so this is their son, Artaxerxes. And Artaxerxes was known to be a pleasant man, to be a man of good temperance and um, very reasonable. You know, that's interesting to think of when you think of a ruler in that time because a lot of times they were totally corrupt and totally terrible. Uh, but this guy was known to actually have like some communication skills. And so this is who Nehemiah works for. And he is his cupbearer. As the cupbearer to the king, oftentimes these men were made eunuchs. And to be made a eunuch, that meant that you were castrated. Um, the reason they would do that was for a few reasons. The first being oftentimes these guys had 100% access to the queen. They would oftentimes stand outside of the king and queen's chambers and helped protect that space to make sure that no one entered that wasn't supposed to enter there. And so say you're the king and your queen is left inside the chambers in the morning and you go off to do your king stuff and you leave your eunuch there to make sure that no one comes in on your wife he was castrated and so his sexual desire was lower. Um, he it, it emasculated them so oftentimes it the kings thought that it made them more subservient and more uh more likely to stay faithful to the king but regardless this is probably nehemiah's plight in life he's been made a eunuch but he enjoys his job he is the number two guy he is the king's right-hand man, he protects the king's cup. He makes sure that it doesn't get poisoned. Oftentimes, he has to taste the wine ahead of time to make sure that the king is not going to get poisoned by some enemy. He is a trustworthy person to the king. So let's read on and find out what happens 
that day when Nehemiah enters into the king's court. Now, I had not been sad in his presence, and the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. So Nehemiah goes to court this day, and he is serving the king, and the king notices that Nehemiah is sad. Now, I want to make a note here. Either Nehemiah always has a good temper, like he's just a pleasant guy and never is upset, and it's that obvious to the king that Nehemiah is, you know, super upset, or the king just has very good discernment and realizes that, you know, from his emotional intelligence that Nehemiah is not doing well. Now, what had been happening was Nehemiah had been fasting and praying before the Lord for days ahead of time. So he enters the king's court and his fasting and his praying has literally taken a physical toll on him. And it starts to, you start to see the heaviness and the weightiness of his sad heart in, on his body. I don't know if you have felt that way over the past two years, but I know that I have. There have been days where I have physically felt the burden of the pain of my heart for what we are having to experience right now. It is very heavy, and the king the king notices, and he says, what's going on? I want you to know that the Lord is not blind to what we are going through right now. The Lord is grieving the fact that we are having to go through this. Have you ever had a situation where one of your children has had to do something hard? Um, My girls are in elementary school and they're just now learning how to do book reports and science fair projects and some of the things that require more creative thinking out of nowhere, you know, coming up with an idea and following through with the idea and bringing it and birthing it into fruition where there was nothing beforehand. The Lord, you know, as a parent, you want to jump in. You want to jump in and relieve them of that pain. You want to jump in and give them the answers and then maybe take the pen and do it for them. But you know as a parent that if you don't let them push through the pain and the discomfort to create it themselves, that they will never actually be fully equipped to do that in the future. That is what the Lord is doing with us right now. He sees what is going on. He sees the pain that we've been going through. He sees the trauma and the difficulty of our situation and our circumstances. He has heard our cries to remove the pressure, to take the lid off, to, to, to fix it all. He's been listening. It's not like he hasn't heard us. But what he has for us is better than the temporary relief of the pain and discomfort. Instead of the temporary relief of the pain and discomfort, he is going to give us a long period of time of joy and celebration after we've gone through this global trial. Okay, back to Nehemiah. So Nehemiah has been found out by the king that he's sad, which is going to give Nehemiah an opportunity if he's brave enough to take it. Let's see if he does. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. God had gone before Nehemiah and he had prepared the hearts of the king and the queen to grant Nehemiah the request to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls. Now, 
we are employers ourselves. We own a couple of businesses and we have an amazing team of people who are completely called to be a part of our organizations. You love your your team, you love your staff as employers, but there is business to be done. And so you, you know, you expect your team to come to work every day. That's just a part of their jobs. Nehemiah is the cupbearer to the king. He is the king's right hand man. And he comes to him and he says, My hometown, my the, the, the place of the grave of my fathers, my ancestors' land has been completely demolished and I need to go back and help them rebuild it. Without a beat, the king says, how long will you be gone and when will you return? That's the only thing the king required of Nehemiah to explain. Not why you or who's going to help you or anything like that. He says, how long are you going to be gone and when are you going to come back? Meaning, how long can we expect to miss you and we anticipate your return. What favor Nehemiah received from the king. That was such a, to me, something that would bolster his strength and start his journey of his um, rebuilding on such a solid foundation to know that the king had found, he had found favor with the king. He had a foundation of support and strength You have that from the Lord right now. The Lord is whispering in your ear right now, you have my favor. Something is coming this year, maybe next year, where he is going to call you to do something really big. And he wants you to know, you, my beloved, have my full favor. You have my favor. What's the plan? Let's plan this together. We're getting ready to enter into a really interesting season of being the church. We've had it drilled into our heads that, or as long as long as I've been alive, it's been drilled into my head that evangelism through the church, through worship and discipleship, it was the forefront, end all, be all of being a believer and that that was our main goal was to go and make disciples of all nations, which is true. That was Jesus's command to us. But I have been very burdened over the past year, maybe even longer, that we're getting ready and already actually have shifted into a new season of what it means to be the church. I am seeing the hand of the Lord lift off of the favor of making mega churches and making churches the end all be all most important thing, like the production value. And it's, it's crazy for me to say that because we literally own a production company and we work with a ton of churches. I'm not saying that you don't do your church with excellence. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that our next layer, the, uh, the moving from milk to solid food right now, that shift is going to be practical callings, real callings of rebuilding after wartime. We have been in a war. I don't know if you recognize this or not. There are not a lot of people putting that word to it, but history will show that this was one of the most intense wars of all time. And it's the people versus the corrupt. It's not right versus left or country versus country. It is literally good versus evil. And when after that happens, after that 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 battle is fought and the victory is won, we will enter into a time of intense rebuilding because everything that was shredded, every stronghold that is demolished has to be rebuilt and in the new structure has to be created with God's vision and only God's people are going to receive the vision on how to rebuild. So depending on what your calling 
in life is, what your gifting is, you are going to be called up by God to participate in this rebuilding. But I want to challenge you and I want to challenge the church that this is a time of rebuilding from a practical standpoint, not a rebuilding of how to rebuild your congregation or how to get people back in church seats again. That will only happen once people experience the real power of God in their lives, the real glory of God in their lives. That is what it's going to draw them back to church. That is going to be what makes them want to get back into corporate worship again. That's what's going to draw your congregations back. But until then, you need to be preaching the message of practical leadership, practical callings. Sometimes practical callings are the greater calling. And in Nehemiah's case, it was. He was the royal cupbearer to the king. There was no greater calling than that until there was. And for Nehemiah, it was to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild a wall. Now, would Nehemiah end up eventually evangelizing to the people and turning their hearts back to the Lord? Absolutely. But first, he needed to rebuild. And so do we. We are going to have to, we are going to have to touch our healthcare system. We're going to have to touch our political systems. We're going to have to touch our election systems. We're going to have to touch education, family, finances, um, everything, business, everything you can imagine. Every mountain of culture is going to have to be rebuilt by believers. And it's going to be time for you to step up and take your place in that hierarchy of the kingdom to rebuild. It's the only way that the glory of God will roll out over this land is for people to experience what it's really like to build with God, to to experience his glory and his favor in their everyday lives. No more just going to church on Sunday and having a Holy Spirit experience in the church and then not feeling him or experiencing him again for the rest of the week. You need to be feeling the power of God as you sit at your computer and do your work every day. You need to be feeling the power of God come on you as you build in your construction company or you tend to patients in the hospital and are called to stand up to that administrator who is forcing you to take a vaccine that goes against every single thing that is pure and true to who you are and to what God has spoken over your life. This season is going to to require great courage and great focus. And as an anointed teacher of God, I am calling the church to that as well. Pastors, equip your people. Equip your people to function in the higher calling of practical callings. We talk all the time about evangelizing to our neighbors, and that's awesome. Like, yes, we are supposed to have friends and community and evangelize. It's a great thing. But there is a practical, oh, I could scream it from the rooftops, a practical need right now for for God's people to literally be his hands and feet on the earth. So stop telling your congregations that politics are evil. Stop it. We need anointed governmental leaders who are filled with the power of God to stand and teach and lead. So stop it. And if you are one of those people, take it and run. Go. Do it. Put your name on the ballot. Get in there. You don't need anybody's permission. If you've got God's green light, do it. Do you think Nehemiah, a eunuch, thought, oh, I'm going to be the best wall builder in the whole world. In our next lesson, you're going to find out that he wasn't. That the wall, as they rebuilt the wall, like it was kind of shoddy work. It wasn't even like all that great, but it accomplished the purpose. So there is a greater calling for you. And the greater calling is a practical calling. 
And as we study the book of Nehemiah, I believe that you're going to receive more and more revelation on what Jesus has in store for you over the next few years to rebuild with him as we take our stand, take our countries back, and celebrate with the Lord. Thanks for being with me today, and I will see you next time.